Okay, turn with me please to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. The Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. My message this morning that I bring to you is entitled Gabriel's Jesus. And we are going to read the account of the announcement that the angel Gabriel communicated to the Virgin Mary about Jesus Christ. Now, yes, this is a, if you would like to call it a teaching in regards to the nature of God and of Christ. And we are living in, very, we are living in perilous times. As a matter of fact, the church has been living in perilous times for close to 2,000 years. All because the church has been trying to find out, the church has been, has been endeavouring to find out who exactly Jesus is. And it's sad because Jesus is perhaps a very misunderstood person even within the church. And this is why today there are so many divisions. This is why there have been so many uh, debates and factions over the identity of who Jesus is. And I would like to encourage everybody, not just here, but even those who are going to hear this, I would like to encourage everybody to listen to the announcement made by the angel Gabriel. You see, if there is anything that I believe should bring unity to the faith between Christians as to who Jesus Christ is, it should be none other than an angel sent by God to communicate. And so we're going to read now from Luke chapter 1 and we are going to see exactly what this angel sent by God communicated. And as you would know, an angel sent by God to communicate the words of God would be extremely careful what that what he says because you're communicating a divine message so read with me now from verse 26 of Luke chapter 1 it says now in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David the virgin's name was Mary, and having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favoured one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. And then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favour with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And then Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. And what I'm going to do now for the remainder of this teaching is hope to take you through this passage to try to illuminate to you what kind of announcement the angel Gabriel gave to Mary. He communicates to her, verse 31. He says to her, And behold, you will conceive... In your womb. This is where we're going to start from. The angel Gabriel comes to the Virgin Mary and he says to her, Behold, I announce to you today that you will conceive in your womb. And those words in the Greek, in other words, that word to conceive or silimsi means pretty much to seize, to grasp, to apprehend or arrest like a prisoner. Have you ever noticed when the authorities want to seize a criminal, what happens? They come to arrest him, they come to apprehend him, and before you know it, 
there is no possibility of escape. He's arrested now. He's been apprehended. He's not getting free. And how does this, how does this word communicate conception? It communicates conception, and this word is actually very commonly used for conception in the Bible because the usage of the word is meant to illustrate that when a sperm grasps the egg, and if you've seen these documentaries, you'll understand, her womb is apprehended as she falls pregnant. Have you ever seen these documentaries when a sperm comes to the egg? And then once it actually takes hold of the egg, what, what does the sperm do? It literally pushes its way through, seizes it, and before you know it, the woman, the, her womb, the, the womb of the female, falls pregnant. She has been apprehended and she can't be, she can't be set free from now. He, you know, she has no choice now to say, well, I don't want to be pregnant. Her womb has been taken captive to a conception. That's the word that is meant to be communicated here. This is what the angel Gabriel was trying to communicate. Your womb is going to be apprehended by a child. Uh, there are other places where this word silimpsi, where the English translators use conception, is used. You don't need to turn there, but in Luke chapter 1, verse 24, speaking of Elizabeth, it says, Now after those days, his wife Elizabeth conceived silimpsi again. Right? Another word is Luke chapter 1, verse 36. Again, the very next verse says, Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. Again, that word, silimpsi. Also, again, it's found in Luke chapter 2, verse 21. You don't need to turn there. I'll read it to you. It says, And when eight days were completed for the circumcision of the, of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived, silimpsi, in the womb. So the word, again, used four times in the space of two chapters, all is meant to communicate a woman falling pregnant. It's also figuratively used. You don't need to turn there again. I'll read it to you. In James chapter 1, verse 15, it says the following. It says, speaking of temptation, then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. When someone is led away by their temptations and enticed, it says when it's conceived in you, it can eventually give birth to sin. So in other words, when lust takes a hold of you, when it's apprehended you and you can't be set free, then if you don't do something about it, it will give birth to the action of that lust, which is sin. And so again, that word silimpsi used in a figurative sense. It's meant to communicate a woman falling pregnant. And this is what now the angel was trying to communicate to Mary. Your womb shall be taken captive with a child. You are going to conceive and fall pregnant, is what he's saying. And in verse 31, it says, You will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. Those words, bring forth a son in the Greek, is get dexion, which that word dexi, again, in the Greek means literally a woman giving birth to. That word dexi is meant to communicate a woman in the actual act of labor. It is a woman now who's actually feeling, you know, as we would say today in medical terms, feeling those labor pains coming forth. She's rushed to the hospital and... You know, in that act, she's bringing forth now a child. That's what that word is meant to communicate. It's used again in other places. Again, please, don't need to, don't need to turn now. I'll read it to you. Uh, Matthew chapter 1. It's Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. It says this. It says, and she will bring forth a son. Again, same word that is used, dexi. Uh, also in Luke chapter 1, verse 57 Speaking of Elizabeth, it says, Now Elizabeth's full time came for her to be delivered. And those words, delivered, really should be translated to give birth to. Again, the Greek word is dexi again. And then again in Luke chapter 2 verse 6, it says, Now speaking of marriage, So it was that while they were there, that the days were completed 
for her to be delivered. And again, those words delivered in the Greek is taxi. In other words, it should be translated to give birth to. So those words are there to communicate the act of a woman in labor right then and there giving birth. So when her, ter- when her days were completed, in other words, nine months, nine months of pregnancy, then finally the day of labor and deliverance for a child. And this is now what the angel Gabriel is communicating to Mary. It says, uh, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son. See, another way of actually translating that verse would be something like this, and behold, you will be pregnant in your womb and give birth to a son. That would be, if you want to call it, a plain and simple translation so that you understand what it means. So now, so now, the angel Gabriel communicates and makes this announcement about Mary falling pregnant with a child She's going to deliver a child and she's astonished now. And she says in verse 34, Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I do not know a man? She's astonished now that the angel is communicating something to her and she's like, Well, I don't understand this. You know, how will this happen? She says, I do not know a man. Those words, I do not know a man in the Greek is epiandra u ginosko. In other words, those words do not know is simply a euphemism. And if you don't understand what the word a euphemism is, it's a mild way of saying, I've never had sexual relations with a man. That's the Bible's way of trying to communicate sexual relations. When it, when it uses the language, I do not know a man. You see it many times. Uh, you don't need to turn there. I'll read it to you in Matthew chapter 1, verse 25, when the angel Gabriel spoke to Joseph about the very same event. It says that, Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took to him his wife, and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn Jesus. So again, it's an, this was... Uh, Matthew's way of communicating that Joseph did not actually have sexual relations with his wife until after Mary had given birth to Jesus. The language of not knowing a man is a euphemism of speaking about sexual intercourse. It's the Bible's way of communicating it, and it is pasted all throughout the Old Testament, you know. We see now Two points, folks. Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, made a very, very um, serious announcement. He announced an impending miracle. He said, a virgin shall fall pregnant. Because this is what Mary was saying. I'm a virgin. I've never come to know a man. I've never slept with a man. And you're telling me now that I'm going to fall pregnant? Never actually having sexual relations. And the angel Gabriel was saying, yes, I'm communicating to you a miracle. Something miraculous and supernatural is about to take place. You are going to fall pregnant without the need of a human father. You are going to have, you are going to be with a child and this child is going to be the product of that is not going to need the intervention of any human father. You are not going to know a man, and yet you're going to be pregnant. And, it's, and, 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 and Matthew chapter 1, verse 25 is a clear revelation that Jesus was not the natural son of Joseph. It says, Mary did not know Joseph. They did not know each other until after she had given birth to Jesus. So Jesus could not have been the natural son of Joseph. And so now Mary is asking, well, how is this going to happen? Tell me, because I'm astonished. And so the answer is found in verse 35. And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the highest will overshadow you, and therefore also that Holy One who is to be born in you shall be called the Son of God. 
And so you see now, the angel Gabriel explains to her how it's all going to happen. He says, look, don't be troubled, don't be astonished. Yes, this is going to be a miracle authored by God himself. He says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Those words, the Holy Spirit will come upon you in the Greek. Epilepsite uh, episi. The words will overshadow you means na episkiasiesi. And I'll explain to you what those words mean. The words epilepsite means to descend, to descend upon, to arrive, and to operate on. It is the same word that is used throughout the entire New Testament that communicates the second coming of Jesus Christ. It is meant to highlight something that is descending out of heaven and arriving on the earth to act and operate. And this is what the angel Gabriel is saying. The Holy Spirit will descend, it will come upon you, and when it arrives, it's going to do something on you. And if you want to see where else this word is used regarding the Holy Spirit, it's found, you don't need to turn there, I'll read it again to you. It is found in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. When Jesus actually promised his apostles, he says, he says in verse 7, It is not for you to know the times nor seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And what do we see on the day of Pentecost when they were all in one accord? What does it say? You know, the Holy Spirit descended upon them like a mush, a, 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 a mighty rushing wind. So, you know, there was like a tangible evidence that the Holy Spirit indeed descended upon the church. And it's the same word that is used in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The same word that the angel Gabriel is now communicating to Mary. The Holy Spirit will descend. It will arrive on you and it will operate on you. And then he continues by saying that the power of the highest will overshadow you. Episkiasis, in other words, it will envelope you like a shadow. It will cover and rest upon you. In other words, what Gabriel was saying to Mary is that the Holy Spirit which is the presence and the power of God, will come on you and will be instrumental in doing something supernatural in you. Think about it now, folks. As I give you now and I share with you certain typologies, the language that the angel Gabriel uses is the same language that is used many times in the Old Testament. For example, Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And from then onwards, what do you see? You see God's creative Spirit creating all things, because the Holy Spirit was hovering over the world. Same illustration. Also, you find in King David in Psalm chapter 33, verse 6, he says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all of them by the breath, or in the Hebrew, the ruach of his mouth, which is another word for the Spirit of God. You don't need to turn there, but in Psalm 104, verse 30, the psalmist says, You sent forth your spirit, and they are created. And you renew them by the face of the earth. The psalmist writing Psalm 104 was trying to communicate and and rehearse the wonderful acts of creation. And he acknowledges that it was by the Holy Spirit, it was by the Spirit of God that he created all things. Because the Holy Spirit, which is the presence and the power of God, is is instrumental in creating all things. And this is what the angel Gabriel was communicating to Mary. He's saying that the Holy Spirit will come on you. It will overshadow you. It's the power of the highest. 
And when it does so, it's going to create something supernatural in you. This is what the angel Gabriel was saying here. Gabriel was highlighting the source of this miracle. He was saying this, that it's God the Father that was going to provide for himself a seed in which Mary was going to fall pregnant. Does this make sense now? God the Father was going to provide a seed. If you want to if, if you want to use another word for seed, I would use the word sperm. He was going to provide a sperm that is so perfect that it was going to impregnate Mary and she was going to be with child and this was going to be a supernatural miracle authored by God. This is what was happening. This, was, this is what was taking place right now. And he continues by saying, therefore, listen carefully now, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the power of the, shy, uh, the, the, power of the highest will overshadow you, therefore also that Holy One who is to be born in you shall be called the Son of God. Listen to the language now. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born. In the Greek it's In other words, therefore also. These words, two little words, are probably the most important words in this passage of Scripture. In other words, for this reason, because of this, because of what? Listen carefully. Because of the above, the angel Gabriel is saying. For the very reason that when the Holy Spirit comes on you and the power of God overshadows you, because of this very miraculous and creative act that God will do, the one that's in you now is a holy one. And for this very reason, this one that is to be born, and those words now in the Greek, to be born, which is the word yenomenon, and that word means to produce, to beget, to procreate. The word means coming into existence by birth. That's what the word means. To, to procreate and to come into existence by birth. Gabriel was saying, because of the creative act, the miraculous act that the God by His Holy Spirit is doing, will do in you and on you, for this very reason, therefore, the Holy One that is being born in you, that is being created in you, will be called the Son of God. The word yenomenon is the same word where we get the words genealogy, genesis, origin, Source, existence, life. It's where, it's, that's where we get the same words. Turn with me to Matthew. And we're going to come back to uh, Luke chapter 1. But turn with me now to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Read with me verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Jesus Christ has a genealogy. He has a genealogy. He is called the son of David, which I'll get into later on. He's called the son of Abraham. He has a genealogy. And where, by definition, you have a genealogy, there, by definition, you have a genesis, a yenisi. You have a beginning. You ha you, your existence begins there. Otherwise, those words have no meaning. They either have a meaning or they don't. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1, 
verse 18. Read it carefully now, folks. Verse 18 of Matthew chapter 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. The birth. That word birth means Iyenia. Iyenia. The genesis of Jesus Christ was as follows. Really is what the text should say. In other words, the angel Gabriel is communicating that the existence of Jesus Christ began here, is what he's trying to say. Listen carefully now, folks. This is, this is the Jesus the angel Gabriel was announcing. I'll share, I'll, I'll share it to you. Gabriel reveals the identity of of Jesus Christ. He announces not, and I'll share with you whom he does not announce. Gabriel does not announce God the Son who incarnated in time and space, taking a second nature of humanity. That is not the Jesus he announced. Neither did he announce what is considered an eternal Son of God who pre-existed His birth and simply came to earth. He didn't announce that either. He announced a divinely created Son of God who came into existence in the womb of His mother. That is the Jesus the angel communicated. That is the Jesus that Gabriel was announcing a divinely created Son of God whose existence began in the womb of a virgin. That is, the, that is Gabriel's Jesus. And I think it's proper that the church accepts Gabriel's Jesus and no one else's. Because it's an angel sent by God. Let me explain to you something about conception, pregnancy, giving labor, and birth. Listen carefully. It's natural. We should all understand it because all of us that sit here this morning have, have, have kids. And understand this. Conception. Conception. When the sperm and the egg come together and life begins. Listen to the language now. Conception. And begetting, laboring to bring forth a child, are the beginnings of a person's existence. Is it not? Is it not? Okay. Highlighting that before this, they did not exist. Because if they did, then it's not conception, it is not begetting, it is simply an incubation. And that is not what the angel Gabriel communicated the language and the words that the angel Gabriel used, he, that he used specifically to communicate that this was a divinely created person. This is the language. This is the words that he uses. Otherwise, those words have no meaning. Listen carefully now if we go back to Luke chapter 1. You need to see this carefully now. Luke chapter 1. He says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, the Holy One who is to be born in you shall be called the Son of God. Gabriel reveals the importance. Listen, this, ha this is important. Gabriel reveals the importance of what makes Jesus the Son of God. What made and what makes Jesus the Son of God? Gabriel reveals this. What made Jesus the Son of God? Well, it's not this. It is not the fact that Jesus, being a Son of God, really was just going, was in a transition from one state of existence into another. No, he's not communicating that. The angel Gabriel says that what makes Jesus the Son of God is is the fact that God the Father supernaturally created Jesus in the womb of the Virgin Mary. That is the reason of why He is called the Son of God. 
There is no other reason. Anything else is not of the Bible. He says it. Therefore also that Holy One that's to be born in you, what does it say? Will be called, called the Son of God. That is the only reason that makes Jesus the Son of God. Because God supernaturally created Him in the womb of Mary. That is what makes Him the Son of God. And there is nothing else that makes Jesus the Son of God except that His very own Genesis was was the appointment and the supernatural act of God Himself. Anything else is not of the Bible. It's not. And this is what the angel Gabriel was saying. Listen carefully, folks. Gabriel's Jesus, and I've named it like that because this is what the angel Gabriel was announcing. What man wants to make of Jesus is really up to man. But what Gabriel announced of Jesus, that's what's important this morning. Gabriel's Jesus came into existence when God, by His Holy Spirit, created Him in the womb of Mary. Listen carefully, folks. This is what pre-existence Christology says. Trinitarians say the birth of Jesus did not bring about His existence. And the language, though, says so. That's right, folks. According to Gabriel, though, the language says it did. So obviously Gabriel nor Luke who wrote it were never Trinitarians. Because you have to understand something. The moment, the moment these words have no meaning and you go beyond what the text says and you begin to imply that there is a pre-existence before, before conception, then you do open yourself up to these ideas of pre-existence Christology and Trinitarianism and every other doctrine that is out there, you do. But the language that the angel Gabriel uses has no room for that. No room. Jesus is called the Son of God because of His divine creation in the womb of Mary. This is why He is called the Son of God It's provable because there was only one other person in human history who also was called the Son of God, and that was Adam. Turn with me to Luke. Turn with me to Luke chapter 3. Luke chapter 3, verse 38. (laughs) Again, (coughs) Luke chapter 3. Uh, Luke goes through the genealogy again, uh, trying to explain who the son of, of who is. And in verse 38 it says that, that Canaan, verse 37, was the son of Enosh, who was also the son of Seth, who was also the son of Adam. And who was Adam the son of? Who was Adam the son of? He was the son of God. Adam was called the son of God. Jesus is called the Son of God. The first Adam was divinely created by God through the dust of the ground. Genesis chapter 2 verse 7. God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Adam is called in the Old Testament the Son of God. And he was divinely created by God through the dust of the ground. And so it is now the second Adam has come who also was divinely created by God within the womb of Mary. It is the same. The typology is the same. To... to, For it to be otherwise is to break the very fabric of the Word of God that God has given to man. Because if if indeed Jesus is the second Adam, and if we would agree with that, then He has to be in every way like the first Adam. Every way. Not a little, not some, every single way.
Turn with me to Romans chapter 5 very quickly. (laughs) Paul, in Romans chapter 5, gives such a wonderful, wonderful illustration of the first Adam and the second Adam. Beautiful illustration here. Romans chapter 5 from verse 15. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ abounded to many. So you see, the fir- through the first man, through the first man, Adam, Sin brought the justice of God because when Adam disobeyed, God brought his justice upon the race of man. He said, you have sinned, you have disobeyed, and the penalty now is death. For your offense against me, God says, I am bringing, bringing the penalty of death. And it's been with us ever since from that, very, from that fateful day when Adam and Eve ate from that forbidden tree, God brought his justice. He said the penalty is death and it has been from the beginning of time and all of a sudden in in the fullness of time God decided to create a second Adam like the first perfect in all his ways just like the first Adam before he fell and because Jesus Christ was perfect to the point of death God through this second Adam through His divinely created Son, now brought the grace of God to the entire world. This is what it says here in verse 15. If by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man abounded to many. Because when Jesus Christ, who obeyed God perfectly to the point of death and took our penalty, our curse and our sin opened the door for the grace of God to be poured out to everyone in this world. And it all happened through one man. Because just as through one man the justice of God came, through one man the grace of God came. And this is the gospel. This is the plan of God. Turn with me also to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. First Corinthians chapter 15, read with me verse 21 and 22. It says, For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. And he's speaking about physical death because the context is about the resurrection to come it is it is about the resurrection of the saints to come he's saying that through one man which was adam physical death have come to all and it's interesting because if you if you do a good careful study between first corinthians 15 and romans 5 you'll understand some wonderful truths that in one man paul says in romans 5 death reigned through the one you know what that means that ever since adam's sin and death came into the world as God's consequence for man's disobedience, that was it. Really, all God was saying to man is, you're going to die, you're going back to the ground, back to the dust, and you're never coming back. Do you know that the curse that God communicated to Adam in Genesis, there was no idea of resurrection? There was no hint of resurrection? Nothing like that. And this is what put fear in the heart of men. Because they knew that when they were dying, they weren't coming back. But then God, in his foreknowledge, slowly began to communicate his plan of hope and purpose through his son, Christ Jesus. And when Jesus Christ indeed tasted death for everyone, that opened up the promise of indeed resurrection again. This is the wonderful plan that God was trying to to bring forth to, to mankind. That through one man, all of the world was going to taste death. But now through one man tasting death, the promise of resurrection was going to come to all man. 
And this is what he's saying here. He says, through one man came death, now by this one man, we can all now taste resurrection. We can all taste immortality. The very plan that God had from the beginning that was thwarted and broken through man's disobedience has been restored through the second man and his perfect obedience. This is the gospel, folks. It's wonderful. I can't understand why there's so much confusion in the church. It all happened through another man, a divinely created man. Gabriel, the angel Gabriel, reveals that God's creative action in the conception of Jesus makes, listen, makes him the Son of God. It makes him the Son of God. Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. Turn with me please back to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. Read with me verses 31 and 32. Behold, you will conceive in your womb, bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. Two times in this chapter, the angel Gabriel says that this is why he is called the Son of God, the Son of the Highest, because his, his, his supernatural birth makes him so. In pre-existence Christology, it is not the case. In pre-existence Christology, Trinitarians say that the conception of Jesus is simply the beginning of his earthly career and ministry. Emptying, emptying the birth of Christ to just some incubation. Robbing it of its excellence, of the supernatural work that God did. It all has just become a little incubator in which for him to travel from one mode of existence to another. I'm sorry, that is not the Jesus Gabriel was communicating. And you know what, folks? Since that day that the angel communicated and announced this wonderful, this wonderful, miraculous act that God was going to do, Paul, the apostles, they all so desired and wanted the church to come to a, the, to a place of unity in their faith about who Jesus is. You know, this was the heart of the first church. This was the heart of the apostles. This was their heart. The church needs to come to a place of unity on this knowledge. You know, you don't need to turn there. I will read it to you. Listen carefully, though, to the language. Paul writes, certain, writes it in a certain way because he's trying to communicate his heart. He's saying here in, in Ephesians chapter 4 from verse 11, and he himself, speaking of Jesus, he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the equipping. That's a poor translation. It shouldn't be for the equipping. It should be in the Greek for the perfecting of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. What knowledge of the Son of God? To a perfect man. What knowledge of the Son of God should the church all come to the unity of? That He is indeed a perfect man. Anything else is not Jesus. Did you hear that? Anything else is not Jesus. Nothing else. This is what Paul is communicating. And this is the reason why Jesus Christ himself left ministries on the earth. He's saying, I want you, apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers and pastors, to perfect my church and bring them to unity in their faith of who I am. And what is happening today? Is there unity in the church? No. Why? Because these very people whom, whom the Lord has commanded 
to, to preach the knowledge of the Son of God are not. They are communicating not the Jesus that the angel Gabriel is communicating. They're communicating another Jesus. They're communicating another one. And it is right and proper that the church will just accept by faith what the angel Gabriel began to reveal and communicate and what Jesus communicated about himself, what the apostles and the church communicated. It is right and proper. We, re we receive what these words say and we do not begin to formulate our own ideas. <clears throat> Listen carefully, folks. Why is this so important? Why? I'll tell you why it's so important. Because what is at stake, listen carefully, what is at stake is the nature of our Saviour. That is what is at stake. What is the nature of your Saviour? Who is He? Like one respected theologian actually asked once, he said this, Is Jesus Christ really a human being? Or did he have the benefit of billions of years of conscious existence before deciding to become a man? What is at stake is the nature of our Savior. Who is he? Turn with me to 1 John. Actually, no, sorry. No, before we go there, please turn with me to Genesis. Turn with me to Genesis. Genesis chapter 49 I want to read quickly two verses about two very wonderful prophecies about Jesus Christ and being the Messiah. Turn with me to Genesis chapter 49. You see, the angel Gabriel said something to Mary. He said this to her. He says that Jesus will be great. He'll be called the Son of the Highest and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And there are messianic prophecies about this in the Old Testament. One beginning in Genesis chapter 49. Read it with me from verse 10. This is a prophecy regarding Judah. It says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes, and to him shall be the obedience of the people. <coughs> this was a messianic prophecy now about Jesus. <coughs> You know, Jacob was saying to his son Judah, he's saying that through you, through, through, your, through you and through your tribe, through one of you, one of your descendants will arise who will be royal. He will hold the scepter. And it's amazing the language that he uses. Look at this. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from, be, from between his feet. What, what does that actually imply? That implies that something between my feet means my descendant. Does it not? One of you, one of your descendants will be a king. From between my feet, Judah, jo Jacob is saying, from between your feet. In other words, what Jacob is saying to Judah is that one of your descendants, of your offspring that will come from your very body, he will be a king. Turn with me to 2 Samuel. Again, God does the same thing. 2 Samuel chapter 7. Because David was a man after God's own heart, and found favor and grace in the eyes of God, <laughs> he communicates this now to him. Second Samuel chapter 7 from verse 12. He says, Now David, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who will come from whose body? From your body. Another translation says, From your loins. Yeah, From within you, David. Someone will come out of you who will actually sit on your throne. It says, to him I will establish the kingdom. He will build a house for my name. I will establish the throne of his kingdom 
forever. This was a prophecy regarding Solomon, but it was also a messianic prophecy speaking of Christ. This is why in the book of Revelation, it calls Jesus the root and the offspring of David. You know what the terminology, the root and the offspring of David means? That as a son of man, he was a biological descendant. He has a genealogy that is traced to David. He has so. We read it in Matthew and in Luke. He was a descendant of David and yet he's the root of David because as the son of God, he is now head of even David. And this is why David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Because one day, David himself will also be subject to Jesus Christ, who is now the second Adam and head of the new human race, of which David will be subject to. We must understand this terminology. Both messianic prophecies in Genesis and in 2 Samuel, both times the writers communicated under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit that the Messiah who was going to, who was going to reign, be a king, and take the throne of his father David was going to be a descendant from a tribe of Judah and from the lineage of David. In other words, he was going to be a flesh and blood man, human being complete with a body, soul and spirit who came into existence in time and space. And he, his creation was so unlike anyone of this world because he was the divinely created son of God. <clears throat> Let's finish now 1 John. First John chapter four. <clears throat> First John chapter four. Read with me from verse one. It says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone out to the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist which you've heard was coming and is now already in the world. You must understand, folks, this is perhaps one of the mis most misunderstood verses in the entire Bible. And I'm here to explain exactly what John was trying to communicate. You must understand this. John, the Apostle John, just like Paul, just like all the other Apostles back in the first century, they were reacting against Gnosticism. They were reacting against a very, very heretical and dangerous and perverted teaching called Docetism. And if you understand what Docetism means, it means this. It, is, it was the belief, and let me tell you folks, these were not unbelievers. These were Christians in the church. There were Christian Gnostics in the church. And they held this belief that Jesus' physical body was all an apparition. It was all an illusion, as was his crucifixion. Because they couldn't understand how... In their mind, in their heart, their belief in the fact that they thought that all physical matter was considered evil, how the church was, uh, how the church believed that Jesus was holy, free, uh, free of sin, perfect, they couldn't understand that. They couldn't understand how a human being could be perfect and sinless, free from all corruption. And in the mind of a Christian Gnostic, they couldn't understand that. So they explained his humanity away and they said, well, look, he's just a spirit being. He's just a spirit being. No, he was not human. He, was just, he only appeared human. And therefore, his death on the cross was all an apparition. And that nullified the, the, the atonement of the cross. It nullified the blood atonement of the cross. And John just reacted against that. And he said, mate, I'm coming against that now. And he put the church on notice. And he said, mate, if you don't believe Jesus is human, you're not of God. That's what he's saying. No, he did not say an eternal son 
took on a second nature of flesh. He didn't say that. He says, no, if Jesus is not human, if he's not 100% human, then you know that what is, you know what is of the Spirit of God and what is not. That's right, folks. <clears throat> if Jesus is not 100% human, then you know what we've done? We've dehumanized him. All we've really essentially made him out to be is non-human, a divine visitor that is disguised as a man. That's all we've really made him if you don't believe that he's a 100% man. He's simply a divine visitor disguised as a man. And that is not the Bible. And, and John warns the church, do not be led astray from this wonderful truth. He is indeed flesh. He is indeed human. He is perfect in all ways. Christian Gnostics can't understand that? Well, tough luck. If, and this is your test, John is saying to the church. This is how you will test the Spirit of God and the Spirit of the Antichrist. You know what that means? That if you don't believe Jesus is 100% human, you are under the influence of a spirit that is opposing Jesus Christ. You are in direct opposition to Jesus Christ. And those are serious words. Serious words. And you know what the, where the church is today? In that very same place. It's saddening, you know, because just like... Joseph and his 12 brothers. Read it. I encourage you to read it in your own time. Joseph's very own brothers were standing before him when they were in Egypt and they couldn't recognize him. So the church today prays and worships Jesus and praises him and reads his word and can't recognize who he is. And Jesus weeps, just like Joseph was weeping in Egypt, that many times he was helping his brethren and would lock himself in his private room and weep for his brethren. Why can't they recognize me? Because they can't see him because they've made another Jesus. And Jesus weeps because the church has not recognized and identified who their Christ is. And it's time that we do. This is Gabriel's Jesus. I don't know who your Jesus is. This is who Gabriel's Jesus is. And this is who my Jesus is. And it's important that the church come to the unity of who Jesus is. Let, let the angel Gabriel communicate this to you. Let the first church communicate this to you. And let the church come to unity of the faith and of the knowledge of who the Son of God is. It's Jesus Christ, a perfect man. Let's stand.